I think a big part of the reason why we observe lower rates, severity, and later onsets of dementia among people who live more like our ancestors and less like us is that these ancestral lifestyles better accommodate these psychological realities. When you take an organism out of the environment to which its species has been adapted, all bets are off as to how well it'll do. As people who watch this channel know, a major focus of mine is the idea that humans, we are a fundamentally small scale tribal species. We spent the grand majority of our heritage living this way. However, in the modern world, we live in a very different way. So the big focus on this channel is that we have a significant mismatch between our evolved ancestral environment and the way we live now. We also have a lot of major psychosocial ills, and I do not believe that these things are unrelated. I think there is a substantial relationship between the mismatch between our evolutionary heritage and where we are now. It is a fundamental dictum of evolutionary biology. When you take an organism out of the environment to which its species has been adapted, all bets are off as to how well it'll do. Now, I've talked about a lot of psychosocial ills on this channel and related it to this issue, but one that I have not brought up at all yet is dementia. Now, this is a big one for me. As I've made passing allusion to on this channel, I'm an occupational therapist of over 11 years now. And most of that time has been spent working with seniors. And a major issue that I deal with a lot of the people I work with is dementia. Now, this has been an area that I've had a level of interest in since well before I became an occupational therapist. And it's because of my background in academic psychology. As I've made allusion to before, I did my undergraduate education at the University of Toronto. I've mentioned that I was a student of Jordan Peterson and John Verveke. I was in the psychology research specialist and cognitive science programs. I then went on to Rutgers for the master's PhD in cognitive psych and cognitive science, though I left their program when I realized how poor the job prospects are but I still love the subject matter. And so in this video, I am going to be talking not just to people interested in these kind of things, but also to patients of mine who I'm sharing this video with and their families. The idea being is I want to give an overview of why dementia is as prevalent as it is, and also what we can do to better manage it, and what we can do to even lower our odds of getting it or at least, you know, getting it severely, lowering our odds of that. So I hope this interests you and yeah, let's get started. Prior to the agricultural revolutions of the Middle East and Asia that date back to roughly 10 to 12,000 years ago, humanity spent the entirety of its history, which goes back an estimated 300 or so thousand years, being nomadic, hunter-gatherer, intensely interdependent, family-based, lifelong tribes. And this lifestyle actually goes beyond just the bounds of what we would call the modern human time period. It goes on to non-human primates, and it even goes back to some pre-primate species. So this is a style of life that has a history that goes back literally many, many tens of millions of years, whereas our more current lifestyle is not very old at all. And in many ways, it can be said that we today are members of a tribal species, but we've lost our tribes. And this is not limited to situations of single parenthood or post-divorce situations. Even intact families are often scattered across the map, seeing each other only infrequently. We move off, we switch schools, jobs, we don't attend religious service very much anymore, and so forth, and so do the majority of our neighbors. And so we are living very differently than the way in which we evolved. And even if we were to stay still and not move, the world around us changes so often because again, our neighbors move, technology changes, and every year the world changes faster and faster and faster. And so it's not unfair to say that we have never been in a time where we've been less familiar with each other and our environment, and we've never been less connected. Now, as I've said, it's an evolutionary dictum that when you take organisms out of the environment to which its species has adapted, all bets are off as to how well they will do. 
And in a world of smaller, less intact, more dispersed families where work and child rearing is done increasingly outside of the home and outside of the family, few groups are being hit as hard by these changes as senior citizens. And one of the byproducts of this, I confidently believe, is an increasing prevalence and severity of dementia. There are far more people today with dementia than there used to be in the distant past. Now, there are good reasons for this. First off, there's just way more people in general. So on those grounds alone, you would expect higher rates of dementia. Thanks, Captain Obvious. Due to medical advances, we often now survive things that 100 years ago or even less would have killed us. And so if we're living into our 80s rather than dying in our 60s, having survived things that might have killed us 100 years ago, there are going to be more people with dementia. And if that was all there was to it, maybe I wouldn't be making this video. The reason for this video in good part is that the list of factors that have driven up dementia in terms of numbers and severity are by no means limited to simply that we have more people who are living longer and are surviving things that would have killed them before. So let me start off by saying that there are already going to be some people who will challenge me and they will cite research showing declines in dementia over the last two, three decades in the United States. And I do not discount these findings. However, consider this analogy. Imagine you're living in a city that over the past 10 years has experienced an 11 fold increase in crime. But let's say that this year crime goes down by 10%. It would be more than a little misleading to act as if crime is going down. Sure, it's lower than it was last year, but it's still roughly nine times higher than it was 11 years ago. Now, when it comes to assessing the frequency of dementia in the past, the further back you go, the harder it gets to get reliable numbers. As such, I'm going to use an approach that is commonly used by anthropologists and archaeologists when they're trying to learn about people from the distant past. And what they do is they study people that are still alive today that live in ways that are very similar to the ways of the past. So let's start by taking it to the furthest extreme. Consider the Tisamani and the Mozetan hunter-gatherer tribes of Bolivia. Researchers at the University of Southern California recently found that while rates of mild cognitive impairment among members of these tribes over the age of 60 are similar to Americans, the rates of dementia in these tribes are fully 11 times lower than that is found among 60 plus Americans. Now, unfortunately, I was unable to find similar research being done on other tribes, and I don't expect people to just figure, hey, these two tribes are necessarily representative of broader trends among hunter-gatherer tribes. And so I wanted to find more evidence. And so my next step was to check in on the Amish, as this is a group famous for their adherence to traditional family structures, traditional ways of doing things, and a staunch resistance to change and to new technologies. Research on the Amish community has found lower rates and later onsets of dementia and cognitive decline than is found among their American age-matched counterparts. Next, I checked on modern Western seniors living in larger households, preserving the intergenerational familial integrity that was common among hunter-gatherers. Now, while I wasn't able to find anything on the rates of dementia itself among people living in these larger households, what I was able to find was evidence that the rates of mortality associated with dementia are lower. So again, we're going in the same direction evidence-wise. Relatedly, I also looked to see if there are any sorts of relationships between religious participation in older age and dementia. I figured this was relevant because similar to hunter-gatherer living, religious participation tends to involve extensive community participation, as well as ongoing engagement with ideas, traditions that believers have been engaged in all their lives. Unsurprisingly, research has found that religious participation in older adults seems to have a protective effect against dementia. So putting all of this together, a reasonable interpretation would be that while yes, there has been a recent decrease in dementia among American seniors the last couple of decades, there was also probably a radical increase in dementia that coincided with people living more and more like us and less and less like our distant ancestors. Again, when you take organisms out of their environment, all bets are off.
To understand how our distant ancestral ways have protected against dementia, it'll help to understand some psychology. So let's start off with cognitive psychology. Firstly, it is easier to understand and work with familiar things than new things. This is fairly uncontroversial and it's why experience helps. Second, it's easier to understand and work with concrete, actual things as opposed to abstract things. To give an example, it is less complicated, more easy to understand how to take an actual piece of paper and put it in a file folder than to take a Word document and put it into a folder on a hard drive. Third, dementia tends to hit short-term working memory much harder than long-term memory. A person with dementia, for example, will often find it much easier to remember where they went to dinner on their first date with their spouse 40 years ago than where they went to dinner with them yesterday. This also applies for memory for routines, skills, and habits. Those learned prior to significant cognitive decline will often persist despite continued cognitive decline. But on the other hand, as cognition declines, these things become harder and harder to learn. New facts, new skills, new habits, new routines, they all become more difficult to learn. The fourth thing we need to talk about is the notion of the just right challenge. So the idea here is if anybody wants to get better at anything, what they want to do is be spending a lot of their time training at a level that is challenging for them, but doable. So they have to try hard, but when they do try hard, they do pretty well. So they don't want to have a challenge that's way below them because they won't be forced to apply themselves maximally, to focus, to pay attention, to seek help, to learn, to grow. They won't need to. Like they'll, they will, they'll be able to do the thing without even paying attention. They also don't want to go against a challenge that is way beyond them because in those circumstances, it's very frustrating, discouraging, whether they try their hardest or not at all, they tend to fail every single time. And so they're gonna give up easier, they're gonna pay less attention, they're gonna try less hard. Because of all these things, they're just simply gonna learn less, develop less. What they want is to be at their own level, at the challenge at their level, or maybe a little above them, such that they really have to try. But when they do, they do pretty good and they tend to get better over time just through practice and learning new things. Fifth, it has been consistently found that regular cognitive and physical exercise have protective effects against dementia. This is before the elder years and during. Exercise and cognitive activity have protective effects. Lastly, moving out of cognitive psychology and into the domain of mental health, it has to be said that people, by and large, they need to belong and they need to have a sense of identity and purpose and they need to feel valued. I think a big part of the reason why we observe lower rates, severity, and later onsets of dementia among people who live more like our ancestors and less like us is that these ancestral lifestyles better accommodate these psychological realities. Let's consider how. Firstly, lifestyles among hunter-gatherers, the Amish, and so forth are far, far more stable across time than is the case with us. It is probably not a stretch to say that the internet alone has induced more lifestyle changes for us in the last 30 years than a hunter-gatherer tribe would experience in over a thousand years. What is more, in contrast to contemporary Western culture where families are small, divorce is common, where people frequently relocate, switch jobs, schools, and they attend religious services less and so forth, hunter-gatherers and the Amish tend to stay with the same people for decades or lifetimes on end. So imagine you're getting up in age. If you're a contemporary Westerner, you're probably retiring. Further, there's a good chance that maybe you didn't have too many kids or grandkids, like maybe you did, but maybe you didn't. And if you did, maybe they don't live too close to you. And so maybe you don't see them anywhere near as often as you would have if you had been born 500 years ago. And if you're in a hunter-gatherer tribe, however, you're probably not so much retiring as you're changing how you engage with and contribute to your community. Maybe instead of doing the same arduous tasks that you used to do, 
you're mentoring others. You're training people in skills, sharing wisdom, helping to mediate disputes in the family and solve problems, looking after kids and grandkids. And you can actually do all of these things because the skills that people need to learn today, if you're in a hunter-gatherer tribe, are pretty much the same skills they would have needed to learn 50 years ago. It's not like you're retiring and in five years, the way that your work is done is significantly different. And it's not like your grandkids view you as dinosaurs because you're not on TikTok. The world is just not that different for your grandkids as compared to you when you were at their life stage, if you're in a hunter-gatherer tribe. So let's see how this hunter-gatherer lifestyle matches the cognitive realities that we discussed earlier. So remember we talked about how long-term memory tends to be much better preserved. Well, for hunter-gatherers in their elder years, the people they're dealing with are the same people that they've been dealing with for a long time. Same people. And the information that they have stored in their long-term memory, which is better preserved, is still very relevant today. The tasks of hunting, gathering, homestead building and maintenance, community defense and the like, these are the same tasks. And what is more, they are all concrete and physical, not very abstract. That's another thing. And if a person can no longer do all the things that they used to do, there's a good chance that there are still other things that they can do to help their community so they can find a new just right challenge. At every level, this sort of lifestyle fits our cognition like a glove, which is unsurprising given that these hunter-gatherer communities, their lifestyles are the result of many, many generations of cultural selection that was based upon biological foundations that were quite consistent. To hammer this lesson home, let's consider a case on the exact opposite extreme. I recently read about a recent study in China, which found that some Chinese seniors were enabled to take on retirement pensions early. And there is no reason to think that these seniors were different than the average Chinese senior. What was found was that this group began experiencing cognitive decline and dementia earlier than other seniors that did not get to retire earlier. And this should not be surprising at all. They're not working anymore and religious participation is very low in China. So they're surely not engaging anywhere near as much as they were pre-retirement. And meanwhile, since retirement, the world has only continued to change faster and faster and faster, leaving them further and further behind, making it harder to participate when they want to. So this is what we're up against. But the good news is, is that there still is a lot we can do to prevent or delay serious cognitive decline and to mitigate both its severity and its adverse effects. Tip number one, establish firm, rigid routines and good skills and habits as soon as possible. As I've now mentioned a few times, in dementia, memory that has already been stored, so like pre-existing long-term memory for facts, habits, skills, and routines, they tend to be relatively well-preserved, often very well-preserved. Whereas as memory declines, it gets harder and harder to learn these new things. I can give an example of this that I often tell patients about. I was working with a gentleman who had severe dementia. He would forget what you told him two or three minutes ago. Now, the reason I was working with him is because he had fallen and fractured his, uh, his clavicle, his collarbone, and because he had fractured it, he was not allowed to bear weight on his arm for a while. And because he couldn't bear weight on his arm, he couldn't use his walker because that involves weight bearing on the arm. And so he had to use a wheelchair. Now here's the problem. This gentleman would forget what you told him two minutes ago, but he never ever ever forgot to use his walker because he started using it either before his dementia started or before it became severe. But good luck getting him to learn to use this wheelchair. This is the first wheelchair he's ever sat in. Let's say he's sitting in his chair, he wants to go from here to over there. His inclination is not going to be to wheel over there. No, his inclination is gonna to be to stand up and walk there. Except now he's standing up from a chair that probably doesn't have its brakes on, and he's walking without a walker. The care staff at his memory care unit could not wait for him to be allowed to bear weight on his arm because they were just petrified that he was gonna fall because he's getting up without a walker from a chair that frequently doesn't have its brakes on. So this shows the two aspects of what we're talking about here. Because he had already had this habit etched in before his cognition declined so severely, 
it stuck. But because his memory, his cognition was so thoroughly declined by this point, he was not going to be able to learn to use that wheelchair. So relatedly, if a person, like this is something you can start before you even have the first signs of dementia. So maybe you'll never get it, but like, let's say if you, you know, you're getting up in age, start developing a life with a routine, like have your morning always go in the same sequence, for example. Learn skills that once you have them will help you later. Develop good habits. If you have bad habits, work on extinguishing them. Because if you were to develop dementia later, or if you have dementia now, but it becomes more severe, which is common, um, the longer you wait to work on getting these routines, skills, habits in place, the harder and harder it gets to the point where it, it, it can just become flat out impossible. But if you have them, it can help you stay safer and more independent in the long run, which will increase your sense of autonomy and it'll reduce how much help you need, which will, you know, make it, you know, you, nobody wants to feel like they're, they're needing too much help from others. And it'll make your family's life a lot easier too. So this is a very good thing to do. Good habits, good skills, good routines, as soon as possible, hammer them in. But actually there's more benefits than just that. So once you have firm routines in place, they can actually serve as memory aids in and of themselves over and above just simply the fact that you're used to doing them. So let's say, for example, every morning your routine consists of six things that you always do in the same order. Well, if you're on number four, you can know with certainty that you've already done the first three, but you haven't done five and six. However, if you don't have a set order, you can't rely on this if you're always doing them in different orders every day. And another benefit is that it'll increase your sense of familiarity and orientation within your day. So when a person has memory impairment, they can often feel disoriented and confused as to what is going on. Imagine you have on the one extreme, you have total order, and on the other extreme, you have total chaos. If you have dementia, you are already naturally inclined somewhat toward chaos because it's hard for you to keep track of the order, just to, you know, forgetting what's going on and so forth. And so having a set order is super duper important because we want to reduce the cognitive burden as much as possible. And if the person has a hard time keeping track of a steady order, imagine how much harder it would be if there was not a steady order. So this order can very much help. It can actually be very emotionally settling. So for example, when a person has dementia, if their routine is thrown off because maybe they have an unusual appointment one morning that they have to shuffle things around to accommodate, they will often feel very agitated. And in a way, it kind of makes sense because one way of viewing it is, is that they're in chaos, that they, their regular daily order that they're very familiar with is off. And so that could put them into a state of sort of like hyper vigilance. And so that's something to be aware of too. When your routine is thrown off, don't be, or if the person in your life that has dementia's routine is thrown off, don't be too surprised if they're more agitated that day. It's, it's, it's normal. And another thing too, though, is that there's actually, once you establish a daily structure, the items within that structure become orienting. So for example, lunch can be considered an anchor. If you're having lunch, you know that it's probably somewhere between noon and two. It gives you an anchor as to where you are in your day reduces confusion. Tip number two, avoid overhelping. Make your rule to give as much help as is needed, no more, no less under most circumstances. Sometimes on occasion, it's okay to give more help. Like let's say for example, the family's in a rush or the person's unusually tired, but generally speaking, that should be the rule. Because oftentimes a lot of family members, they feel obligated and a duty to provide lots of help because they kind of just feel like, this is my mom or my dad. They did so much for me. What kind of a son or daughter would I be if I did not give them everything they needed? And then also some people, they, they overhelp and it's, and, and it's not for such noble reasons. It's because simply it saves them time. But when you do this, it's not good for the person. You do not want a person to get too used to vacation mode, especially if they are developing dementia. You do not want them to routinize dependence. That is a hole that gets increasingly hard to dig oneself out of. And on top of that, it is bad for the person's sense of autonomy, self-esteem. Like who wants to feel dependent? It's not a good feeling for most people most of the time. And also in terms of your own time, consider using this approach of giving only as much help as is needed as an investment. Yes, it will take you longer to help the person if you're limiting how much you do for them. It'll take longer than if you just did it all for them. 
But the idea being is if you use this sort of approach, they're more likely to maintain their independence and get more independent over time through the use of this approach, thereby saving you more time in the long run. So it's an investment for you and it's an investment for them. And this is particularly important in the early and early mid stages of dementia, because as I've said, the further a person goes along, the harder it gets to have them be actively engaged. But if they have a, a if they've already developed the skills and routinized them, there's a reasonable chance that despite declining cognition, they will continue to be able to do these things. And in fact, actually keeping them engaged in these kind of things can can slow the decline too. So multiple benefits. Tip number three, grade and fade. Grading and fading is a technique for helping a person develop or relearn skills. And it's also a great way to know that you're not over helping. So here's how this works. The idea being is the grading in grading and fading means matching the amount of help you give to what is needed. No more, no less. And the fading refers to over time, trying to gradually fade yourself into the back room, providing less and less help over the course of days, weeks, months, and so forth. So I'll, I'll give an example of a time that I implemented this. I was working with a gentleman with very severe dementia. I wanted to work with him on brushing his teeth for himself. Two reasons. One is if we can get him back doing this, it's one more thing he doesn't need help with, so that's good. And two, it's a multi-step process. And so he has to be able to remember all the steps and what order they go in and which steps he's already done and which steps he hasn't done yet and how to do each step and how to how long to do each step for and so forth. So it's cognitively challenging. He has to maintain all that going on. And as I said earlier, physical tasks and familiar tasks are easier than novel and abstract ones. And so what's more familiar and physical than brushing your teeth? So anyhow, here's what I did. I brought him to his bathroom and I pushed him right into the doorway in his wheelchair and I asked him, can you go brush your teeth? And he just you know, looked around. He didn't do anything relevant. I gave him about eight seconds. I always do that because when a person has dementia, one of the things is the processing speed can be slower. It's, it's almost like they're buffering, buffering, buffering. Sometimes if you give them a little extra time, the page will load. They just need some more time. So I gave him eight or so seconds, but still nothing happened. So what I did was I pushed him up to the vanity, the sink, and I asked him again, can you brush your teeth? And once again, you know, just picking lint on his shirt, not doing anything relevant, gave him eight seconds. So then I pulled the water, toothbrace, toothbrush toward him and made them prominent. And I asked him again, can you brush your teeth? Again, nothing, eight seconds pass. I put water in the cup and I take the cap off the toothpaste. So as you see, I'm, I'm simplifying it every step um, where you, you can't do it. I simplify it by one step, maximum two. So now I asked him to do it again. And once again, nothing happens. So I simplify it again. I put toothpaste on the toothbrush. Then he did everything, everything. He brushed his teeth and I watched him. He did a good job. He did not forget any part of his mouth. He rinsed after and then he put the cap back on the toothpaste and he put it away and he put the, he dumped the rest of the water out, put the cup away, put the toothpaste away. It was like once he got it, he got it. And I know that I didn't overhelp him because I was only giving him incremental bits of additional help on the level of one or two steps at a time. So the most I possibly could overhelp them was by one step. So that's the grading part. I didn't just jump in and do everything for him the second he couldn't do it upon the first request. Now the fading part, it refers to over time. It's trying to see if over time you're working with this person, you keep going through the same sequence. But the hope is, is that over time, you'll need to do fewer and fewer steps before the person's like, oh, I get it. And, and, and then ideally you get to the point where, you know, you just bring them to the bathroom and you say, can you brush your teeth? And then they just do it. So, so, so this is a great strategy to use, especially if the person is, the, the, the dementia is not too far gone. It takes more patience when, when the person has very severe dementia, but it can still be done a lot of the time. But a big thing though, is to be humble in how many of these tasks you take on at once. I would not be doing this for anywhere near all the things the person has to do. A good approach might be to say, pick one morning activity to really drill down on and one afternoon activity to really drill down on and to not add more until those two are learned to the point where all you have to do really is just maybe do the first step for them or, or not even that. Once you get to that point, then you can move on to the next one. You know the old expression, if you chase two rabbits, both of them get away. Do not overburden 
them and yourself. You will drive yourself and them crazy if you do this with too many things. Tip number four, never stop engaging in just right challenges. As I said earlier, these are the challenges that allow you to grow and maintain your abilities at the optimal level. You cannot do better than this. If the task is easier than a just right challenge, then you're not getting as much out of them as you could. And if they're too hard, again, you're not gonna get as much out of them because they will overwhelm you. Not everything a person does should be a just right challenge because that would be exhausting. But a person should continually engage in just right challenges on a regular basis. Now, this will sometimes mean, you know, as a person gets older, you know, we spend most of our life either moving up or staying the same. And even during that period of staying the same, for much of that time, we actually do have the option of going further up. It's like a 34 year old. Just because you can train to run a marathon doesn't mean you do. But a lot of 34 year olds who don't train to run a marathon could, were they so inclined. So even though they may be staying the same, they, they, they actually have the option of going up. But eventually we get to the point in our life where we have to fight and fight and fight just to stay where we are. And then we have to fight and fight and fight just to slow the decline. It's almost like that, you know, was it Alice in Wonderland? You have to run as fast as you can just to stay right where you are. And so as that starts happening in life, the big thing is to start modifying the things you do to keep them challenging, but doable. So if something that was once doable becomes increasingly undoable, can it be modified to make it once again doable? If it can, great. And if it can't, okay, can we find a new activity that would be challenging, but doable? The idea being is keep on just right challenges. The just right challenges may change. What, what's easy may become difficult. What's difficult may become easy. But the idea is, is to move the level of challenge of what you're doing to where you're at. Tip number five, engage in arts and crafts. Now it may seem somewhat silly that I'm suggesting arts and crafts for grown adults, but they along with similar activities like puzzles and safe woodworking offer a lot of benefits for people with dementia. Firstly, arts and crafts come in many shapes and sizes and types. It's a very broad category. As such, there are many options in terms of what could potentially be interesting to the person and also what is the right level of challenge. You can find arts and crafts at various levels of dexterity requirement, for example, so you can find those just right challenges. Secondly, they are concrete and physical. Again, as I've said, that is easier than abstract. Third, they are multi-step goal-oriented processes. Because they're goal-oriented, they will set off the dopamine system of rewards. And, you know, so that'll make them fun and interesting, rewarding. And because they are multi-step, it is now cognitively challenging. You have to learn the steps, remember the steps, remember the order of the steps, remember how to do the steps, remember which steps you've already done and which ones you haven't done yet. And so you are working on the size of your cognitive storage capacity to see how many things the person can juggle. You wanna practice that. You don't wanna have the person stop engaging in things and then their bandwidth starts contracting more than it needs to. Next, working with one's hands in challenging activities can really get the brain working. You may have heard that it's believed that the evolution of opposable thumbs in humans was one of the driving factors behind the explosion of higher order human cognition between motor planning and coordinating many precise, intricate, organized movements, your brain is hard at work when your hands are engaged in high precision activities. So again, keeping the brain working. One theory as to why dementia happens actually is that the brain is a very hungry organ. And so it, it almost might be like, like a nutritional economization thing where if we don't make the brain work, the body will start economizing by giving the brain less nutrients. And so that's one theory that I've read about. Maybe it's wrong, but in any case, right or wrong, brain exercise is good. Another thing that really puts one's brain to work is social involvement. Working and playing with others, keeping track of relationships and obligations. Indeed, it is possible, if not absolutely probable, that social challenges were the single biggest driver of human intelligence and creativity, more so than opposable thumbs. Which brings us to tip number six, be tribal. Humans are first and foremost a social species. And in fact, for most of our evolutionary heritage, being alone too often was a serious risk factor for death. It's not a coincidence that children hate being grounded and prisoners would often rather be among other prisoners who could possibly hurt them than be spending a lot of time in the box in solitary confinement. 
And by be tribal, I don't mean the bad sense of, for example, distrusting people outside of your tribe and things like that. I simply mean strive to uphold, rekindle, and or establish relationships and regular interaction with family, friends, religious community, and so forth. The religious community has many benefits for people experiencing or looking to impede cognitive decline. In addition to providing structured, regularly occurring social organization, it also leverages long-term memory in that attendees see many of the same people week after week in the same building, and they read the same book, and they sing a lot of the same songs, and they engage in a lot of the same traditions, celebrate the same values, and so forth. So leveraging long-term memory. Tip number seven, leverage long-term memory. Recall in dementia. Previous learning tends to be hit far less hard than one's ability to learn new things. People with dementia can lean into this area of relative strength by, for example, engaging in familiar activities and traditions, talking about old times, and watching familiar TV and movies, documentaries about topics they're familiar with, and game shows that tap long-term memory, things like Jeopardy and Family Feud. In addition to leaning into an area of strength, engaging in long-term memory heavy activities can actually help a person with dementia engage in just right challenges right here in the here and now. So for example, when one is watching familiar TV shows, even though they are able to lean on their long-term memory, they still have to be paying attention and following along. If they're talking about a familiar topic with people, they still have to be paying attention. They have to remember what has already been said and what hasn't been said yet. If they're telling a story, they have to remember what the story is, what they've already told, they haven't told yet, what the people that they're talking to know and what they don't know, so you, so you know what to tell them and so forth. There's a lot of cognitive work happening here. Now, compare that to if the topic was something new or the TV show was a new show. Well, if it's new content, the person is going to have a much harder time of knowing what's going on and keeping up. And as a result, they will often very soon into the conversation or show just check out. And if they check out, they'll stop paying attention. And if they stop paying attention, well, now they're not working on their ability to stay focused. And they're not, you know, if it's a conversational, they're not sort of remembering what they've already said and what hasn't been said yet and all that. They're not getting that cognitive exercise that they would have gotten if the challenge was a just right challenge. Now, something that could be particularly enjoyable and useful, actually, is watching familiar TV shows that are standalone episodes. So for me, I often tell patients I'm working with that part of my dementia plan for myself is to watch a lot of Seinfeld. There's a multiple benefits of this for me. So one is that I've seen every episode dozens of times, and so I'm very familiar with it. So if my short-term memory falters on me, there's a very good chance that my long-term memory will not. But on top of that, the episodes are standalone. What I mean by that is that there's very little in the way of a story arc that goes across episodes and across seasons. Essentially, to watch and enjoy an episode, really all you need to do is pay attention to this episode and have a decent memory of what's happened within the last 20 minutes and have a general knowledge of who the characters are and how they relate to each other, and you're good to go. Now, by comparison, I am, in addition to being a fan of Seinfeld, I'm also a fan of Breaking Bad, and I've seen every episode of it several times. I would not want to watch that if I had dementia because there's just too much to remember because there's storylines that go across episodes, seasons, and the whole show. There is a lot to remember. And if I had dementia, I really wouldn't want to watch a series that I'm not familiar with because in that case, I have to get to know all these characters and what's going on. And not only do I have to remember what's happening in this episode, I have to remember that the reason that Bill hates Bob is because five episodes ago, Bob keyed Bill's car. If you have dementia, that is going to be an overwhelming challenge. And if you really want to get the most out of watching familiar shows, especially if they're single standalone shows, that would be probably the gold standard here. The person with dementia, it would be great if they watched the show with somebody else who also like it because now they're sharing an activity they're connecting with somebody else it is very easy with dementia to feel alienated so any way you can connect with others is a good thing and then on top of that you're connecting with others maybe you can talk about what you're watching with them like you know either during or after the show now the person is engaging in something that's happening right here right now with somebody else like that is it's perfect 
And what is more, and I'm just gonna a little aside, people sometimes ask me, they, they say when a person has dementia, I want my dad back, I want my, my mom back, my wife, my husband back. What they mean is that if they have dementia, like it's very hard to talk to them and relate to them in the way you used to. If you want to get them back, one of the best things you can do is lean into long-term memory. You will lose them increasingly if you talk about new things and engage with new, novel, unfamiliar activities. If you want to have them back, talk about the old times, talk about old wisdom, ask them questions, engage in activities that they've liked throughout their lives. If you want them back, that is one of, if not the best ways to get them back. Tip number eight, I just alluded to this. Remember that the person with dementia still has things to offer. While they may require more help now than they ever have before, for their own good and for that of everyone else, they need to contribute to the family wherever possible and to others around them wherever possible. This may be in the form of things like helping to watch the grandkids, teaching people new things that they know a lot about, providing wisdom and guidance, contributing to household upkeep and so forth. And this even applies for people with advanced dementia. If their abilities are limited, limit the task, limit the challenge, but don't eliminate the task or the challenge. Again, just right challenges. The challenge that is just right for this person will obviously be lower now than it would have been 10 years ago. So we want to lower the challenge to make it appropriate for them, but an appropriate sort of low task is infinitely better than no task at all. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen people that are older with dementia and they're engaging in something very simple, like coloring in a coloring book, but also things that are helping too, like folding up laundry or helping doing cleaning. That is so much better for them most of the time than having them be bored. When you're bored, you start thinking too much and you start noticing your confusion. But when you're folding laundry, well, you know what you're doing. I'm folding the laundry. So there's less to be confused about because you know what you're doing. And, it, and also it's good for your sense of feeling connected to others. Like I'm a part of this team, I'm contributing. And, and maybe you're working in parallel with the person with dementia. Maybe they're folding up laundry as you're cleaning in the room with them. And so like, you know, you guys, you're doing different tasks or maybe you're doing the same task next to each other, but you're both a part of the same team. This person is not gonna feel like they're just this ineffectual person that needs all the help and offers nothing, which is not a good feeling for anybody. Tip number nine. Extinguish bad habits and establish good habits as soon as possible. So I alluded to this earlier too. Common bad habits that I work with people in dealing with are things like dragging their feet when they walk, forgetting to use their walker or their wheelchair or the cane, or forgetting to set their brakes in their wheelchair before they stand up. So long as the person's dementia is only in the mild or mild moderate range, for situations like this, there's a simple behavioral modification technique that I show people that I, I, I just call it the post-it note calendar method. And it can be very helpful. You use this if you, if you swear too often and you want to swear less often, you could use it for that. If you're dragging your feet and you want to stop doing that, you can use it for that. The way it works is the person keeps a piece of paper like a post-it note on them and they keep a pen on them all the time. And every time they or someone else notices them making the mistake they're trying not to make, such as dragging their feet, they have to take out the piece of paper and put a mark on it. And it has to be them who does it. So someone else can't make the mark for them. It has to take them out of their autopilot. It has to kind of annoy them a little bit. So the idea is every time they or someone else catches them making the mistake, damn it, the mark on, back in the pocket. They do that every time. At the end of the day, they write on their calendar how many mistakes they caught. They were caught or caught themselves making that day. So maybe it's seven, so they write seven on the calendar for today. They do this every single day until the number on the calendar has been zero for roughly a week. Once that's been accomplished, you know, your, your habit has been changed. You can stop this. If you backslide, you maybe you pick up the post-it no calendar method again briefly, but that's how it goes. And like I mentioned earlier, when it comes to grading and fading, this is the kind of thing where when you chase two rabbits, both of them get away. It is hard enough to change one habit at a time. So I would only work on this one habit at a time. Don't try and do this with more than one at once. Do it on one, get that habit sorted out and hammered in the way you like it, and then move on to the next one if there is a next one. Another approach when trying to help reduce bad habits and replace them with good ones is for someone to block the person from doing the bad habits. So as an example, let's say if a person is new to using a wheelchair and it's the first chair they've ever sat on that has brakes and wheels on it, 
and so they frequently stand up without setting their brakes. In this case, when I see this, what I'll do is, I've got an eye out for it. When I'm working with someone and I know I'm gonna ask them to stand up soon, I keep an eye on them closely when I'm asking them to, stand, to get up or whatever. And if I notice that they are about to stand up, I will wait to the last second because I wanna give them every chance to have that memory click in. But if, it, if they get to the point where I can tell they are gonna stand up without their brake set, I'll just jump in and I'll be like, wait, 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 wait. What did you forget? And, and I won't tell them what they forgot because I want them to remember. And if they don't remember, then I'll tell them. So once either they remember what they've forgotten or I tell them that they've forgotten to set their brakes, I'll ask them to do it for themselves. I won't do it for them. And I'll tell them the reason that I'm asking them to do it is that every additional time they do it themselves, they're hammering in the habit a little bit more. And so that's another approach you can use. Block the mistake and encourage the person to enact the right behavior themselves. This type of training is based on the fundamental neuroscience doctrine by a Canadian, uh, that was coined by a Canadian neuroscientist actually. It stated what fires together, wires together. And essentially what that boils down to is the more you do something, the more the neural architecture underlying the behavior gets strengthened and hammered in. And the more you don't do something else, the weaker the connections that underlie that behavior get. So we're trying to make the connections that represent the learning of the right behavior stronger, while we want the neurological connections underlying the wrong behavior to atrophy as much as possible. Tip number 10, habitualize daily to-do list and calendar use. This is huge. Do this as soon as possible, especially in, if you don't even have dementia. Make this a habit. As I've said a few times now, frequently as a person's memory and cognition declines, they are able to maintain previously established habits and routines. If a person is in the habit of making and referring to daily to-do lists and you know keeping their appointments on a calendar and checking their calendar before they have significant dementia, like this is absolutely huge because they will habitualize a major compensatory strategy to deal with impending cognitive memory decline. If they can use this habit, they will be far less likely to forget to do the things they need to do. But if they don't have the habit of using a daily to-do list and using a calendar for their appointments, as their dementia proceeds, it'll get harder and harder to set these habits in, which will mean they will be more dependent on others, more likely to make mistakes, more at risk of problems. Tip number 11, leverage the environment. There are a variety of environmental strategies that can be implemented to work around cognitive decline. The first one is everything in its right place. The scissors always go here. The phone always goes here and so forth. Actually, I shouldn't have said that the, the phone, that's a bad example because the phone should always be with the person when they're alone, I'll get to that. But anyhow, everything in its right place. Remember, order and chaos. When it comes to routine, we are ordering time. When it comes to keeping things in their right place, we're ordering space. Secondly, Use strategically placed written reminders and organize the home strategically to aid with memory. So the idea being is if a certain device or piece of uh, equipment or whatever is used in a certain area of the house, like that's where it's needed, put it there. Right thing at the right place at the right time. Also, what you could do is you could put morning medicines on the breakfast table so that it's hard to miss it when you have to move it out of the way to put your cereal bowl down. Put the nighttime medicines on the nightstand right next to the last lamp you switch off right thing at the right place at the right time. You could also use strategically placed written reminders. So as an example, next to the last light switch the person switches off at night before they go to bed, have the list of end of day reminders there. They're very likely to see it and act on it. And especially you wanna do this early. You wanna get them into the habit of looking at that list. So right thing, right place, right time. Tip number 12, incorporate useful devices. Useful device number one, a pillbox. It is very easy, especially if a person has a multi-medicine routine, to accidentally take the same pill twice or not take it at all and so forth. So having a pre-prepared pillbox that has the right meds and the right doses is very helpful. It also, it's a great way to know that you've taken the medicine or that you have it. It's very easy first thing in the morning to get up and then 10 minutes later, be genuinely unsure if you took your medicine or not. You know, you think back and you think you remember having taken it, but you're not certain if that memory was from today or from a previous day. Whereas if you use a pillbox system, all you have to do is look at the pillbox and see if the pills are in there or not. Another idea is an electronic 
programmable pill dispensers. So these are devices where you could set up programs for them where they will dispense multiple medicines on different schedules as appropriate. I once worked with a woman who had severe dementia and her daughters both worked. And so she was at home by herself during the workday. The daughters would call her a couple times a day just to check in on her. And one of the things they would say is, do you hear a dinging noise? The reason for that is because the electronic pill dispenser lets off a chiming noise when it's dispensed medicine until the medicine has been taken. So if the mother said, yes, I, yeah, I hear that dinging noise, then the daughter would just say, okay, yeah, go to the pill machine. There's something waiting for you. Next, the person should habitualize keeping their phone on them at all times when by themselves. The last thing they want is to fall here and have their phone be two rooms over or forget where they put it. If the person does not dependably remember to keep their phone on them when they're by themselves, another very good idea is an emergency call button system like the bracelets, you know, the help I, I fall on and I can't get up bracelets. And ideally one with a built-in fall detector. They have built-in fall detectors now. You know, you, you do this and it'll ask you if you've fallen. If you say no, then it's over. But if you say yes, or if you say nothing at all, it'll call an emergency contact person. So imagine if you're the family member of a person who has dementia. Imagine how much more peace of mind you will have when you leave the house, when you know that the person at home with dementia has an emergency bracelet that they always wear. They're not gonna forget it. They're, if they have an emergency, it's always right there. And, if, and let's say if heaven forbid they fall and they hit their head and they can't call for help, well, the thing will probably be able to tell that they fall and it'll call you anyway. The chances of them also messing up their medicines are much lower with the electronic pill dispenser. This is great for the autonomy of the person because a lot of people who are, you know, they're getting up in age, it's rather insulting to be told you can't be home alone. This is better for them too. It's better for everybody. Another recommendation is helping the person habitualize the use of a pre-programmed microwave oven for a small number of set meals, very few. You want them to learn this because that'll allow them to be safer for longer. One approach that you could use too is to avoid using just the programs, but just have the person use the add 30 seconds button because that way the chances of, it's like you can, if you press a button wrong when you're setting the time, one minute can become 10 by one wrong button press. But if you're just hitting the 30 second thing, if you accidentally press it or don't press it as many times as you think, you know, it's a 30 second error. So that's something that can be very useful. So these sorts of devices, as I said, can provide a lot of peace of mind and greater autonomy. It's a win-win. Tip number 13, always err on the side of caution for risky activities. So when it comes to things like what we've just discussed, like things like medicine, as well as finances and cooking and risky home upkeep activities like repairs, mopping, vacuuming, and so forth, where costly accidents could happen, when in doubt, provide more help not less. It's not worth the risk. Okay, now let's close it out. Last thing, here's the 14th and final tip. Caregiving is often not a one person job. Caring for a person with dementia can be very demanding. It's important to be humble. Be humble enough to solicit help from friends, family, social services. If you burn out, everybody, including the person you're helping, and of course you lose. One thing that you may want to look into is talking to your doctor about getting a referral to talk to a medical social worker. There is no part of the medical social worker's job that is bigger than knowing about social services and who qualifies for them, who benefits from them, and how they get them. An excellent program that you may want to look into is state-funded paid family caregiver programs. In these programs, Pending the completion of a basic skills training program, the government will pay a family member to be a caregiver to a person in the family, as opposed to the government or the insurance company or someone else subsidizing a paid caregiver from outside of the family. And usually it's not gonna be just one, but a revolving door of strangers. They're having the family do it themselves. That, that's awesome. And because they're being paid, now that family member, maybe they don't have to worry about working outside of the home. And so they're not overburdened much better. So that could be a program that is definitely worth looking into. And then on top of this, there are also respite programs, home health aid and housekeeping services that you may possibly qualify for, support groups for the family members and the like. And, and then also there might be financial assistance for things like useful home equipment or home modifications. So 
these are all things that are worth looking into. And a medical social worker is the best kind of person to ask about what you may benefit from and qualify for. Since you've made it this far, I've got one more great set of tips for you. Simplify your communications. Unlike me, try not to talk too fast. Also, try to communicate ideas one at a time rather than jumbling in a whole bunch of ideas at once. And where possible, try to eliminate distractions. So for example, if you're making a video on how to better manage dementia, don't do something silly like put a whole bunch of music in the background. It could really distract somebody. Bad idea. Let's try and keep it very undistracted. Keep ideas one at a time. Try to talk real slow, just like I do. And also, don't forget to try to replace open-ended questions, such as, what do you want to watch on TV? with multiple choice closed ended questions. So for example, would you rather watch Seinfeld or The Office? That will greatly constrain the sort of mental search space. It makes things much clearer, more easy to understand, and therefore more easy to answer. So that's it. We are done. I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment. If you're one of the people I've worked with, patient or family, as I always say, you're welcome to call me, email me, or if you have any questions. I hope you like this video. I hope you find it useful. If it's worth sharing to anyone you know, go for it. If you want to subscribe, hit that button. And that's it. Bye.